Welcome to the North Ridgeville City Schools Board of Education meeting. Today is Tuesday, May 21st, and it's 6 p.m., and I'd like to call this meeting to order. If you would, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Ms. Yetzi? Here. Ms. McCarthy? Here. Ms. Saxon? Here. Ms. Tamura? Here. Mr. Bach? Here. Oh, that brings us to approval of minutes. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the video transcribed meeting minutes for April 16, 2019. Further, it is recommended that a written summary of the special and regular minutes for the meetings on April 2nd, April 6th, and April 16th be approved. No. Second. Moved by Mrs. Tamura, second by Mrs. Saxon. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Tamira? Yes. Ms. Saxon? Yes. Ms. Yetzi? Yes. Mr. Baca? Yes. Ms. McCarthy? Yes. That brings us to the superintendent and treasurer's report. Thank you, President McCarthy. We have several items today under our superintendent and treasurer's report. Uh, the first, I would call to the podium our assistant superintendent, Mr. Hearn, who would like to recognize for the final time this school year our staff members of the month of May. Right. Good evening. On behalf of the Board of Education, it is my privilege to recognize two staff members, one certified and one support staff for the, uh, eight, for the, May, for the month of May staff recognition. Staff recognition candidates are nominated by their peers for their contributions to the North Ridgeville City School community and the significant impact that they have on the students and families they serve and the colleagues they support. The first person I'd like to invite up to the podium is Ms. Sheila Wobke. If she would please come up here. Ms. Wobke is at Ranger High Tech Academy in grades 7th and 8th. Ms. Sheila Wolke was hired to teach at Ranger High Tech Academy in 2017 for the inaugural year of the district STEM school. Ms. Wolke brought great experience as an instructional mentor and manager of professional development from Constellation Schools in Parma, which helped her transition well as a STEM teacher at Ranger High Tech Academy. One of her non nominators wrote, Sheila is not just a seventh grade teacher, she is a teacher to all. She is constantly helping all grade levels, learners, and coaches strive to be their best. She gives up her own time to be involved in numerous committees for the district and is an amazing coach. We are honored and lucky to have Sheila at Ranger High Tech Academy and North Ridgeville City Schools. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. Next, I'd invite uh, Jennifer Phelan to come up, please. Ms. Phelan? <laughs> Ms. Phelan is a paraprofessional and instructional aide with the NRAC 5 through 8. This is Ms. Phelan's first year with the North Ridgeville City Schools. One of her nominators wrote, Ms. Phelan is an instructional aide in the 7-8 intensive needs classroom at NRAC. This semester, I met Ms. Phelan while she was assisting two eighth grade students in my advanced Google Apps class. From the very beginning, Ms. Phelan's dedication to her students was evident, and she makes sure daily that her students get the most out of the technology class. If she isn't familiar with an app or web tool that's being used in class, she takes the time to learn the material before it's presented to the students. Ms. Phelan doesn't hesitate to ask questions for complete work on her own, to become more acquainted with the material. She demonstrates patience while working with her students and encourages them to persevere and see the benefits of their own work. Mrs. Phelan personalizes each project by gearing the assignment towards each student's personal interest. I've enjoyed working with her this semester and witnessing her engage with the students. Overall, Mrs. Phelan is an asset to the students she services and we are fortunate to have her working with our middle school students. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. the Board of Education, we'd like to present you with these plaques, and we've had students at the high school have made you personalize the water bottles. Awesome. 
Mark Hoffman. 
beautiful right there. You too. It is. Mr. Hoffman is retiring as a head custodian for 27 years of service to North Ridgeville Schools. Mr. Hoffman was hired as the food service truck driver during the school year and maintenance worker during the summer of 1992. He transferred to the maintenance department full time in 1997 where he remained until becoming the head custodian at the Education Center, now ECLC, in 2010. His retirement was effective January of 2019, and we thank Mr. Hoffman for his service to our school. Denise Versoski. Mrs. Prasoski is retiring from North Ridgeville City Schools Transportation Department after 33 years of service. Mrs. Prasoski started in the Transportation Department as a paraprofessional bus aide in October of 1986. Denise became a full-time bus driver in August 1989 and will retire as a bus driver effective July 1, 2019. We thank Mrs. Denise Prasoski for her 33 years of service to our Mrs. Sprague is retiring from our school district as the current administrative assistant to the director of curriculum and instruction after 31 years of service. Mrs. Sprague started in food service as a server, then cashier at Liberty Elementary in 1988 and moved to the junior high in March of 1990. In November of 1991, Mrs. Sprague accepted the position of Support Services Secretary in the Maintenance and Transportation Departments. During this time, Mrs. Sprague was also a substitute cleaner in the district. In January of 1994, Mrs. Sprague transferred to the high school to become the Principal Secretary. Mrs. Sprague became the High School Finance Secretary for the Treasurer's Department in December of 1995, and in December of 2002, Mrs. Sprague took the position of Administrative Assistant in the Curriculum Office, where she will retire effective July 1, 2019. We thank Marion Sprague for her 31 years of service to North Ridgeville City Schools. In total, these retirees have served 197 years with the North Ridgeville City Schools. And it is by no accident that we are where we are today with such exciting opportunities before us because of staff members that are committed to our district. And we thank you all for all you've done. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. 
that we consider when we're compiling the forecast would be what is needed in our students to compete in terms of educational opportunities, trends and impact on tax revenues, uh, economic trends, commodity prices play, play a factor, interest rates play a factor, uh, testing requirements, state mandates, all of these things, technology, things that we use on a regular basis or some of the large classes for a district, uh, we kind of need to stay abreast of. And then working with the leadership team in the district, that's how the forecast eventually is compiled. Just to give you a very brief overview in terms of our revenues and expenditures, for the last several years, we have enjoyed surpluses. We are bringing in more revenue than what we have been expended. That has been occurring for the last five, six years. This year in FY19, we will also generate a small surplus. But starting in FY20, that line is going to cross and we will start incurring deficits. Our expenditures are rising at a rate faster than our revenues. That again is typical of every school district in Ohio. We are typically capped in terms of how much revenue we get from the state and we are limited in terms of growth when it comes to property. On the expense side, they tend to increase with inflation. It also tends to increase with the number of students. As our student count continues to increase and we bring in more and more kids, we are going to incur more and more cost. That is effectively a given because we need teachers and support staff to keep the schools operating depending upon the number of students that are enrolled. Uh, those revenues, as you can see, in further out years 21, 22, and 23, they actually start to decline. The reason is that we have levies on our ballot, four emergency levies that all start to expire next year. Those are levies that bring in a fixed dollar of revenue, and as they expire and fall off the, the tax duplicate, 
we will lose revenue. The hope is that we will be able to uh, have those levies passed and renewed in order to at least keep the revenue stream where it is today. But in terms of the forecast, I'm required to take those out because there's no guarantee that those will be voted on and approved. Probably difficult reading this. Um, the numbers at the top part of the chart show revenue expenses and the surplus or deficit. You can see the deficits in that center box start escalating rapidly. Um, cash balance down near the bottom, and then there's a line that says levy replacement. So in fiscal year 21, 2.3 million is the revenue loss from the levies. In fiscal year 22, it's 6.9 million. And in fiscal year 23, it's 13 plus million dollars. Uh, so it is critical that we renew those levies to keep the schools operating. There would be no tax increase in those type of levies. Risk to any forecast because, you know, what we used to say in industry was that any forecast, the only positive thing you can say about it is it will be wrong. There's no way you can predict with 100% certainty what will happen in two, three, four years. But you make reasonable assumptions and use judgment depending upon the trends and what's happening to come up with what's a reasonable forecast for what will occur. Legislative changes to the state funding formula is always a wild card. We, um, and it seems to happen every time there's a new governor or a new change or in, in the uh, state house that they want to come up with new ways to fund schools. And they're always tweaking the formula. It's hard to determine or understand what they are actually going to do. So for the time being, we have to sit tight and keep the revenues flat. I don't believe we will actually lose revenue with changes to the formula. We may possibly get some additional revenues, but that's undetermined at this time. Changes in student population as the population increases, obviously our cost. We don't know exactly how many students we will get every year, but we know they're coming. Northridge Rail is growing. There's a lot of new construction every year. And the more homes that are built, the more kids that will be attending our schools. Legislative mandates, again, state or federal. <clears throat> and then economic impacts like interest rates, property values, inflation, and commodity prices. Interest rates have been increasing, uh, so the cost to borrow is certainly increasing as that goes forward. Uh, if they continue to rise, the hope is that the yield curve, that long-term rates will stay relatively low compared to short-term rates so that any borrowing needed will not escalate in terms of its cost. Uh, we've been fortunate that the debt that we have incurred has been at relatively low levels. And we did refund uh, $38 million of our bonds last year, which saved us approximately $6.3 million in interest over the life of the bonds. So those types of things are risks, and also there are opportunities. Again, that's the high level view of the board. Thank you, Mr. Galindo. Um, <coughs> to community update. Thank you so much. Good evening, President McCarthy, Vice President Saxon, members of the Board of Education. It is my pleasure and honor to share with this community all of the exciting things that really stand before us tonight. Before we get into the district and community update, I would like to bring to the podium Ms. Caroline Rado from Burgess & Burgess, who's going to help me through some of this data, um, and share with the community what our North Ridgeville greater community expects from our schools and how we're going to proceed based on what we just learned from our five-year forecast and Mr. Berlingo. <coughs> Creating our preferred future. Back in July, we created with many hands at the table, a new district mission and vision. And it's important to know that at the heart of all of the decisions that we make are this mission and vision. Mission and vision. 
Um, Mr. Berlingo talked about educational adequacies and making sure that our students have the tools and appropriate means to learn in our schools. And that is part of what we do every single day. And it is how we make decisions. You can't see this at all, I recognize that. But let me talk through. Uh, this is another graph talking about the money that we bring in, um, our receipts, as well as our expenditures. And what is important here is the focus on our local sources. And what that means is the community's dollars that they share with our school district, and they vote upon every time there is a levy on the ballot to support our schools. Right now, we depend on our community for roughly $25 million. The state shares with us $16 million. To put that in perspective, right now, our salaries and benefits are just about $30 million. So our state shares don't even cover what we need to do business on a daily basis with our staff, which is why this community is so important to us. And we need to talk a little bit further about those levies that Mr. Berlingo was referring to. Despite our growth over the last 10 years, and we have registered nearly 500 additional students in that short 10-year span, we are still operating at the same funding levels that we have been since 2012. We have not gone back to the community for new operating dollars since 2012, and at that time of passage, we promised 10 years. We maintain to keep that promise. We do have four emergencies operating levies that are set to expire, and those account for nearly 40% of our operating dollars. Two expire in 2019, one expires in 2020, and one expires in 2021. The law has changed to allow us to combine those four separate issues into one issue. And to give you some perspective of what that means, emergency levies right now bring in a fixed dollar amount which means as new people move into this community, we don't gain more revenue from that happening. We could combine those four emergency levies into what is called a substitute levy, which is a fixed millage amount, which means every resident, every household pays the same millage. It is not new money, it is not new taxes, it is the same for all of those who are currently paying. The difference is when people move into the community, they would pay that same millage versus what happens now and that they don't. Over the course of this forecast, we would gain nearly two million additional dollars if we were to be successful in combining those emergency levies into one. We do recommend that the board consider placing the substitute on the November ballot. Again, this would not increase our taxes. One thing to keep in mind is the difference between operating levies and bond issues. Again, the operating dollars go to our everyday expenses, our salaries, our student needs, etc. versus bonding capacity, bonding dollars are only put toward actual facilities, which we know we have to address as well. We do know that there is a lot of reasons right now that we're going to talk through here shortly of why we need to consider renovating our current buildings to bring them up to the adequacy that we expect here in North Bridgeville. If we were to be successful with the substitute levy, again, this would help keep us solvent through 2022 and hope that at that time we could potentially even extend that further if need be or if possible. Um, and again, keep that 10 year promise that we did in 2012. But we do know we have something to address with our facilities, and this is the second part of this, this community and what we are working through right now. We are the third fastest growing city and school district in Ohio. We are the first fastest growing city and school district in Northeast Ohio. We are growing at a 3 to 4% rate of student per year. That is huge, and that is an anomaly. Just ask the state, they'll tell you. Right now, we have the high school and Liberty Elementary that are at capacity and nearly over capacity in some cases. We did have the state of Ohio come in to assess our buildings, and if you remember when this building was built, uh, that happened with the old elementary, the old middle school. And the old middle school 
put us into a situation as an emergency school district to go forward and build a new middle school, which we've captured here at the academic center. At this point, the state has come in and deemed that both Liberty, actually Liberty, Ranger High Tech Academy, or the old Lear North, and the high school all meet the two-thirds threshold. And what that means to us is that if it would cost more than two-thirds of a new building just to renovate it, the state would recommend that we would rebuild buildings. In other words, don't put money toward bad trying to renovate a building that might not be able to be up to speed with what we expect in the community <coughs> from start over. Um, and in some cases, as we've learned throughout our master's facilities planning process, it is actually cheaper to do that than to try to renovate buildings that currently exist. We know that right now in those buildings specifically, we are lacking up-to-date fire safety and security measures. We know that students in those buildings are learning in spaces that were never intended to be classroom spaces, but we're making do with what we have. Right now, the high school, Ranger High Tech Academy, and Liberty are not accessible to students with disabilities, community members with disabilities. And in some cases, these classrooms are far too small to be configured for modern education. Currently, these buildings are taking away from our daily operating and from what we do with students every day just to maintain them and keep them structurally sound. Good news, when we built this building, the state was our partner and provided us 17% of the funds necessary to build North Ridgeville Academic Center. At this point, due to our growth and due to lots of factors in the community, our equity rank has risen to 24%, which means the state will reimburse us 24% of the cost if we were to move forward with any future facility projects. We are working toward a solution. There is a facilities planning committee um, that has been working for nearly 18 months to come up with a recommended solution. This committee is made up of city officials, parents, residents, educators, business leaders, uh, certified and classified staff members. And they are taking a look at detailed analysis of the buildings, the site plans, options. Again, we already know that the state has deemed um, all of these buildings really to be start from scratch. And they are planning to make their final recommendation to our Board of Education on June 4th. And we are really excited to hear from that committee to learn about what it is we can do in North Ridgeville to bring these buildings up to the standards that this community deserves and expects. The committee also identified four major factors, and I think that's important to mention, based on what we've discussed. That was dealing with the high school, dealing with Liberty and Ranger High Tech Academy, trying to determine a better solution for maintenance and our transportation um, garages. Right now we have run out of space in uh, both of those buildings, and they also are definitely lacking the adequacy um, that those um, staff members deserve, such as bathroom facilities. Things that we all take for granted um, are not necessarily things that are up to par in the spaces. And finally, a performing arts center. How can the district address our need for continued performing arts, and what does that look like moving forward? So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to <coughs> Caroline Rado, who's going to talk to us a little bit about how we've arrived here, the data that this community has shared with us, and what we are going to do with this data moving forward. Hi, everybody. Um, so one of the inputs for the Facility Planning Committee is research. And we, um, I'm with Burgess and Burgess Strategist. We're a communication and research firm. And we put together a comprehensive um, community outreach plan together with much feedback and input um, prior to sharing that with the Facilities Planning Committee and then making the recommendation to the board. So what we started with is um, 23 in-depth interviews with community leaders. Um, we did listening sessions with teachers and residents. And then we fielded an online survey with 1,435 opt-in respondents, which is a, a great um, response. And then what I'm going to speak um, mainly about tonight is a phone survey. We did a statistically valid telephone survey of the electorate. It was conducted by a third-party polling firm, and I am relaying the results of the um, poll to you all. 
Um, it was a sample of 400 voters in the community. Um, calls were made to landlines and cell phones, conducted May 6th through 8th. And um, when I go through re the results with the 400 person sample, um, the results of sampling error is plus or minus 4.9%. And for some of the subgroups, is about 10% um, plus or minus. Um, and we asked a question about uh, the combining the substitute levy, um, which the treasurer and superintendent referred to. But the focus of the uh, telephone survey was about the facilities plan and what the facilities planning committee had been considering regarding what to do moving forward. Um, so initial support with no data, so with no information, just a straight question, would you support a um, bond issue? was at 50%. 50% um, said that it would be for it, and 31% of those people said they would be definitely for it. After more information, so throughout the course of the survey, you have them on the line as a captive audience for sharing statements about the bond issue, what it would mean, what it would provide to the district. So after more information, support moved from 54% for the issue to 33% definitely for it. And just as an overview of some of those most impactful statements um, that resonated most with the people that took the survey were that 80% said that new, were, it was positive, that new schools positively impact the local economy and community. 73% responded positive, positively to new buildings will have modern fire suppression safety and security systems. 67% responded to the high school being overcrowded. Another two-thirds uh, responded to that new schools will have classrooms that are large enough and configured properly for today's education. The support was strongest amongst parents. Women under 50, your wards one and two, and then residents who've been here 10 years or less. And I'm gonna go into some more specifics of the survey findings. So one thing that we wanted to find out is baseline. What does your community know about the conditions of your schools? The elementary school we asked about was Liberty and then also the high school. That big yellow chunk is the I don't know. And that's not surprising because most of the electorate that we spoke to aren't closely affiliated with the district. But what you see there is an opportunity that the district needs to tell them what's wrong with the condition of the schools and make sure that there's communication on multiple different channels to make sure they get to those people not affiliated with the district. The other boxes there, 7% think Liberty Elementary is in good condition, 26% say it needs minor repairs, 14% say it needs major repairs, 18% in the red on the left says it needs to be replaced, and then again, the 36%, the plurality there, say, I'm not sure. Um, residents are more likely to say the high school is in good condition or only needs minor repairs. On the right-hand side, you have 21% that say the high school is in good condition, 26% say it needs minor repairs, 10% major repairs, 15 say it should be replaced, and then again, the yellow 28%, the plurality there again, say, I don't know. And the takeaway here, again, is that residents need to be told. They're not in the schools as the parents are, for example. They need to have communication about the facility's needs and understand why the district would be considering seeking a bond issue. We then asked about what have you heard about overcrowding issues. And if you look down this, the uh, top one is all the voters. So a slim majority of 55% of voters say they have heard a lot or some about overcrowding in the schools. And if you go down the left column, that 83% is your parents. Parents are aware of overcrowding, while if you keep going down, 48% right below that are your non-parents. They don't really know about what's going on with the overcrowding in the district. Among those who support the bond issue, 75% at least know something about overcrowding. And then when looking at undecideds, people who are not sure about their support with the bond levy, or those who say they oppose the bond issue, 60% of bond issue opponents and 52% of undecideds on the bond issue do not know much or anything about overcrowding in the schools. Thus, it's imperative for residents to understand the current overcrowding situation in the district and how those factors um, 
how that factors into the importance of seeking or pursuing a bond issue. So as I said, we had one question in there about the combination of the substitute levies, and this are the results of that question. As you see at the top, 68% um, indicated that they would support a substitute levy. Of those, 47% I'm going to have to read this because that is blurry to me about my glasses. So of the supporting, 47% say they are definitely for it, and 21% say they are properly for it. Um, going across there, 18% are against it, and then you have the 15% who are undecided about combining the four emergency levies into one substitute levy. Support for the substitute levy, looking down the bolded column in the middle for total four, so looking at that column, you can see that support tops 70% in wards one and two with parents, newer residents, registered Democrats, nonpartisan voters, and women. Only men, if you look at the second bolded column, the total against, only men at 23% against oppose the levy at a higher than average level. Almost all bond issue supporters are also supportive of the substitute levy, and 31% of bond issue opponents support the substitute levy. A substantial 50% of voters who are still undecided about the bond issue indicate they will support the substitute levy and none oppose it. The important takeaway here is that almost all of the bond issue supporters at 97% also support the substitute levy. These participants understand both of the needs, the operation side and the facility side. This is one of the key data points that highlights why we would recommend taking a shot at both the no tax increase substitute levy and a bond levy in November. As for the bond issue, again, a similar chart here shows that 50% of voters say they are for the bond issue. And this was at the start of the survey, as you recall, without information being provided to them. 31% are against it, and 20% are undecided. Among those supporters, 31% are definitely for it, 90% are probably for it, 8% probably against, and 23% definitely against. Support will obviously need to grow significantly, but there is an opportunity for persuasive messaging and communication to move the needle in the direction that's desired. Looking down the column of the bolded um, in the middle, um, parents are at 72%, and voters who are also for the substitute levy are at 71% strong supporters for this levy. One third of voters um, in wards three and four, non-parents, registered Republicans, men, voters over 65 oppose the bond issue. And then about one in five voters are undecided across the board, which is that last bolded when looking at potential electorates, so general versus off-year um, um, elections or primaries versus generals, there's virtually no difference in the bond issue's chance of passing in a high turnout versus a low turnout election. So as I said, we asked those vote questions up front and then we provided some information. So we asked um, a bit of, or we shared rather, some information about the schools to see how they would respond and ask what um, would be more likely for them to support the bond issue based on knowing these facts. And um, while none of the statements have an overwhelming impact on voters, those focused on overcrowding pack the most punch. So as you see that top one, 50% of all voters are more likely to support the bond issue after hearing about the growth and enrollment in the district. And 48% are more likely after learning the buildings are over capacity. 48% are more likely to support the bond issue after learning that the state will pay 24% of building costs if it passes this year. And then voters are less responsive to arguments about funding levels and the facility planning committee's recommendations. And we shared some more statements about the schools and the bond issue to see what would resonate the most. And you see at the top, 80% of all voters strongly agree or agree that new schools help property values and the local economy. There is agreement that the plan must include a performing arts center and auditorium. And it's good news that 55% of voters trust the schools with their tax dollars. And a majority of 52% disagree with the statement, I'd like to vote for the school bond issue, but I can't afford it. 
Again, we see a mis mixed reaction about the need to replace both the elementary and high school. And this goes back to the earlier response about them not knowing about the conditions of those buildings. Undecided voters are particularly likely to say both the elementary and high school are fine and don't need to be replaced. And they're less likely to trust the schools or their tax sellers and voice concern about affordability. We provided some reasons that should um, about the um, facilities and whether or not they would those reasons would um, make them support the bond issue. And voters are most responsive to arguments about the improvements that would come from new buildings. So as you can see, two thirds or more of voters say that each of these statements is a very convincing or somewhat convincing reason to support the bond issue. The new buildings, modern fire suppression, safety and security system, top the list and convinces 73% of voters to support the bond issue. The other top reason to support the bond issue is that new schools will have classrooms that are large enough and configured properly for education today. And then you have some high school specific arguments that are next on the list and include making the high school fully accessible to students and visitors with disabilities, updating it and using new technology, getting students out of rooms not intended to be classrooms. And voters also um, responded positively for the need for a gym and cafeteria at the elementary school. And then the financial arguments are a bit weaker, but still compelling. So my last slide here is the change in support. As I said, we had an early vote question, and then we asked it again. So after hearing all this information, how would you vote on a bond issue? And as you can see at the top, the support goes from 50% to 54% for all voters. The slight movement is <coughs> supporting the bond issue at the end of the poll after they hear all those arguments. And <coughs> you can see, looking down the list, that it's consistently moving in the ideal direction, um, with men and voters age 65 remaining the least likely group still to offer their support. The small movement towards supporting the bond issue indicates that ample and frequent communication is necessary. Residents need to understand that Liberty Elementary and the high school need to be replaced, that the schools are teeming and bursting at the seams. Residents need to hear the messages about facilities um, which resonated most, including the modernizing safety and security, alleviating overcrowding, <coughs> updating technology, and adding the performing arts center. And as you can see, the movement in the right direction is what we want to see, but it will take focused messaging and a concerted effort to make this move into reality. So, <coughs> so based on the qualitative data that we um, got early on through the in-depth interviews, listening sessions, and online survey, and then coupled with the quantitative data here, we again would recommend pursuing both issues, an operating and a facilities issue in November. This election provides the greatest chance with an off-year electorate and an already supportive voting group to help deal with your two critical issues, operating and facilities. And likely with a substitute levy on the ballot pending your decision, if the political action committee is already expending resources, time and energy towards an advocacy campaign, then it should maximize those resources and take a shot at both levies in November. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back to it's a lot of information, but what is our reality? Where are we? What can we do here in Northridge, though, to address not only our operating dollars, but also our facilities? And what does this look like moving forward? We know at this point that we have a very short window in which we can levy Addition, well, additionally, $132.9 million for the purposes of facilities, so for bonding dollars. Right now, we are working with the state, as we talked about earlier, and they have projected our enrollment for the next 10-year period to max out at 5,100 students. We have information from the city that varies somewhat which could take us to anywhere between six and 7,000 students based on what the city is currently projecting. We think that we've worked out a formula with what the city has in place, what the state has in place, and really taking a look at our reality. Again, with that top number, what can we do at this point in time? And how do we approach our enrollment from a perspective that gives us flexibility in the future 
to build what we actually need for the students we have. With what we've entered into with the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission, um, we are in what is known as the ELP program, which is different than the program that we built here, which was the Classroom Facilities Program. ELP is Expedited Local Leadership, um, Local Partnership Program, which is good news for us because that will allow us to build for what we need and the state will actually fund us for the number of students that we have at that time, which gives us that flexibility. <coughs> um, we know at this point that we still have some work to do and the Facilities Planning Committee is working through that now in order to make this final recommendation to the board. But we know that we are going to have to build buildings that can be expanded down the road if and when we are in a situation um, where we continue to grow at this rapid rate. Again, as Caroline said, we have the support right now with Citizens for Better Schools and an active campaign to really take a shot at both of these issues in November with the support coming on the side of our operating dollars to then transfer that to a potential bond issue. We are working with TDA, which was our architect here at the Academic Center, to put this master's facilities plan in place. And they have been working with our facilities planning committee over the past 18 months to really get to the recommendations that the board uh, will be shared with on June the 4th. Again, we know that we have to continue to reach our community and share with them our reality. We need them to understand the conditions of Liberty, they need to understand the conditions of Ranger High Tech Academy, and they need to understand the conditions of North Ridgeville High School. We have started some of this by means of communication. Um, some of you may have noticed some of our weekly communication that is going out in a different format. We will be sending out some quick one to two minute videos also addressing some of these um, concerns that we've been sharing with you. Uh, we have started a speaking tour. We've been going building to building. Um, in fact, we're wrapping up that tour tomorrow. And we'll be having those same conversations out in the community at any event where we would have the platform to speak with our community members. Again, our goal would be to have all of these items in place and to effectively communicate with our constituents on what we are doing to address their concerns and to address their expectations of us as a school district in order to provide for this community and our students the facilities and the materials and things they need to learn effectively in our schools. And our goal at this point is to complete this by November. So again, we have a lot of work ahead of us, and we do appreciate the vast support that we are getting from our staff, from our community, um, from our Board of Education, and really being flexible in working through all of this data that is coming our way in a very short time. Um, we are an anomaly in North Bridgeville, and we need to address our growth. This is the time to do it. We have the right staff in place to do it, and we truly have a one-time opportunity right now that we do really need to consider. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, as the board will join me. We sit here by myself. Right? We have lots of information tonight and really good information um, that we will have an opportunity to digest and um, make decisions that that are in the best interest of our students. Um, I am going to at this time call for a brief intermission um, and then we will do announcements afterward. Anyone has a pressing announcement now? Do you guys have any announcements now? That you need to? I have a question. Um, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I okay, that'll be in just a minute. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you want to announce the endowment funds fundraiser dates? I don't know. Really? You don't know them? I don't know. The endowment funds fundraiser is coming up. Our July... June 6th at Fiesta Jalapeno. June 6th at Fiesta Jalapeno. And the golf outing is... And the golf, in, golf outing is June 13th. And there is online registration on the endowment committee's website that you can find under the community 
tab of the district website. Are there any other announcements board before we take a Starts at 11 a.m. It's here at Ranger Stadium. It's free, right? Yes. Great event. Lots of fun. That's the annual friendly. also be Parks and Recreation's annual Touch and Trump event. Beautiful and jolly fall venues that day. I believe that's also on the website. Yes, it is. And it was in the newsletter. Yes, it was. Thank you. I want to say congratulations to our two staff members over the month this month and to all our staff members um, that have um, been recognized this year um, as staff members of the month. I want to thank the um, staff members that have nominated them and the committee that has uh, worked hard to um, choose those people. Um, I also want to thank our retirees this evening and um, I know those of us that, I'm sorry, there are some people in the room that are leaving. North Regional City Schools, um, but not retiring, and we want to thank you as well for your service to the district. Um, thank you for keeping students safe, and thank you for keeping students first in your um, endeavors at North Regional City Schools. At this time, we're going to take a brief intermission. We're going to have photo opportunity um, for our VIPs, staff members of the month, and our retirees out in the hallway. Revenues remain strong at 549,000 year to date versus 353,000 in the prior year. 99.2% of available cash resides in securities or interest bearing accounts. The rising interest rate environment this past year has contributed to the additional revenues for fiscal year 2019. I motion to approve the finance audit report in one reading. Second. Moved by myself, seconded by Mrs. Tamira. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. McCarthy? Yes. Ms. Tamira? Yes. Ms. Yancey? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Mr. Bob? Yes. Thank you. The state of Ohio requires school districts to file five-year <laughs> forecasts each October, then update that forecast in May of each fiscal year. The forecast reflects three years of historical actual data and estimated amounts for the current, plus four additional fiscal years. The forecast is developed by the treasurer in conjunction with the district leadership team and reflects current trends in enrollment, property valuations, staffing, educational initiatives, contractual commitments, and state funding. It is used as a guideline for budgeting and spending over the forecast period. Adjustments are made as conditions or assumptions change relative to funding and spending requirements. I motion to approve the five-year forecast as presented by Mr. Berlingo in one reading. Moved by myself, seconded by Mr. Vodka. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Vodka? Yes. Ms. Yancey? Yes. Ms. Saxon? Yes. Ms. Tamira? Yes. Based on the presentation shared by Mr. Berlingo and Mrs. Casario, the board is considering placing a substitute tax levy on the November 2019 ballot. The passage of this issue will not increase taxes and will allow North Ridgeville City Schools to capture the growth of our rapidly growing city. 
This levy will replace the four current emergency levies that exist. Even with our continued growth, the district has not levied new money since 2012, with a promise not to come back to the community for 10 years. We remain committed to that promise. This is a first reading of the resolution to consider the substitute tax levy. You know, and this is the first reading, so we're not going to vote on that tonight. Just <laughs> it takes us to page 21. We'll go to other board business now. Ms. Saxon? Under other board business, we have some human resources items to consider. Three certified staff, one ESY support staff substitute, two substitutes, two support staff substitutes, one support staff adjustment, nine certified staff leaves of absence, three support staff leaves of absence, one certified staff resignation for retirement, one substitute support staff resignation. I motion to approve the other board business report in one reading. Second. Moved by Mrs. Saxon, seconded by Mrs. Yetzi. It's on page 24. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Saxon? Yes. Ms. Yetzi? Yes. Ms. Tamura? Yes. Mr. Baca? Yes. Ms. McCarthy? Yes. That was hearing of public on new items. If anyone would like to speak about an item that is not on the agenda tonight, I don't know what that would be because there's a lot of stuff on the agenda tonight. <laughs> but you're welcome to do so. Okay, it is recommended that the Board of Education enter into executive session for the consideration of the purchase or sale of property at competitive bidding. If premature disclosure or information would give an unfair competitive or bargaining advantage, to a person whose personal private interest is adverse to the general public interest. Moved. Second. Moved by Mrs. Saxon, seconded by Mrs. Tamira. Is there any discussion? Roll call, please. Ms. Saxon? Yes. Ms. Tamira? Yes. Ms. Yatsi? Yes. Mr. Baca? Yes. Ms. McCarthy? Yes. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our public portion of our meeting.